Okay, so welcome to the Mayao series gardening and yard revitalization session presented by Professor Anne Emsley. Thank you, Anne, for being here today. We are uh, recording this session, so um, take it away. All right, well, I'm going to share my screen because I need, since I am a professor, I have to have prompts to know what I'm talking about. Um, Okay, so I'm just gonna go through some basics, you know, so I just so we're all on the same page. Some of you might know all this stuff. Um, and then some tips on sprucing, okay? So a lot of us, uh, me included, um, need to prune some of our, maybe our trees and our shrubs, okay? And um, so, you know, poor branches, or maybe we need to let in light. Um, so pruning, um, Pruning needs to be done like um, thoughtfully. Um, you don't just go out and hack like we see so often. Um, and we never want to remove more than one third or even a quarter at any one time. So if it needs more than that, like it's really a mess and you think it needs, you just have to do it in increments, okay? Um, and, you know, we control plant size, but there is a limit, you know, like sometimes the wrong place, plant is in the wrong place. And people always ask when, and that's a tough one in Hawaii. Um, if you notice, you know, you just had a lot of leco, it just flushed. Um, that's not a good time because the plant has used its excess energy to, you know, put those leaves out and then you cut them off and then it has less stored energy. So, you know, let those leaves harden off for a little bit and, uh, a couple months or a month or two, and then you can prune, okay? Um, so, but it's tricky, different times of the year for different plants, I guess. And usually it's when you have time is the reality. Um, yeah, so there's different pruning with younger plants versus older plants. Um, so what happens is, um, it looks like the plant is, when you prune, it looks like the plant is like growing better. Uh, but remember you've removed that energy making part. And so the roots have stored some energy and they're sending that energy there. So it's actually a, a somewhat of a stressor. So it tends to dwarf it a little bit and the top and the roots are somewhat in balance. Um, if you cut the top, the roots die off in response to that and you have less roots. So um, less stored food. So it's, you know, it's, there's, there's a cost to pruning. Okay. That doesn't mean you don't want to prune. It just means you want to be judicious. Okay. Generally, somebody's asked me about young fruit trees actually lately, and each species is a little different. Um, but, um, one thing about plant at planting, you really, the research is, we used to prune the tree pretty severely and then plant it. That was kind of the old way of doing things. Um, but the research shows that even some of those side branches that you don't really want that have leaves on them, they actually help the plant. Because really what you want to do when you first plant is for it to grow roots. So if there's really a nasty branch you don't want, yeah, take that off. But you might want to leave that. And you may not have to wait one to two years. That might be more of a main, you know, our trees can grow year round even six months and then maybe take off some of those lower branches, but give it a chance to, you know, it's gonna sit there in that same pot that it's in um, for a while and you want plenty of energy going to those roots to get them to grow out. So, so wait a little while before you do any serious pruning on, any, on your young trees, particularly like citrus. They don't like to be pruned when you first plant them, okay? Um, mature trees. So the idea though, is that you prune up your young trees. Um, so you get a nice, um, structure that you want, um, which I always forget to do. And before you know it, multiple years have passed and you've got a lot of big wood. Mature trees ideally shouldn't be pruned all that much. Um, you should have a reason to remove a branch. Um, the re you know, and obviously remove dead or hazardous branch. And a reason might be it's crossing or it's too close to another branch. Um, 
but ideally you're mature. So some of the pruning you, that you see being done is like really hard on those mature trees. And there's really kind of a, not a great reason to do the pruning that we see. Maui has some of the worst. If you want to see bad pruning, Maui's the place. Okay, Maui has some of the worst tree pruning on the planet um, and not a lot of good pruning. Um, definitely remove dead or hazardous branches. Um, and then just, just make sure you don't over prune. Um, and the reason is for mature trees, wood, the part that's wood is dead, that those cells aren't alive. And so when you cut wood, cut into wood, there's only certain cells on a plant that can grow. And so if those cells aren't there to kind of heal it, what we call close the wound, that wood is now exposed and it's never gonna be, um, healed. And so that's a place where fungi can get in, you can get rot, um, termites, those kinds of things. So, um, so be judicious with your older trees. Okay, so probably a lot of you know this already, but just, just to review, if you have a larger branch, if you just went and cut it here, what will happen is, is you're sawing, the branch will be heavy and it'll lean down and then it'll rip the bark right here. Well, it's actually right under the bark is where the living cells are. And so then you'll get a big giant wound that probably won't heal. And so what you wanna do is, is cut a little notch like this where it says number one, and then you cut through, whoops. I love my little mouse. Um, then you cut through and what'll happen is that branch will start to creep down, but it'll break right at this point. Now you have a, a much lighter branch that you can now cut where you're supposed to. And basically there's, in some trees, it's more obvious than others. There's this bark uh, ridge. You don't wanna cut into the bark. So um, what you wanna do is cut just past the branch collar which in some trees is really easy and very obvious and some trees it's not. Um, but you don't want to cut, in other words, you don't cut flush to the um, trunk and you cut just outside of this. You don't want to leave a stub because that can rot, but right over here, this can heal up. Okay, and you'll get that circular um, healing if everything goes well, okay? Um, let me patty, okay. And then usually it's kind of at a little, the cut is at a little angle. Okay, for smaller stuff, which that's a little easier to do, um, is you, you generally are trying to cut, it's called heading back. Like, let's say I don't want this branch. You kind of cut back to the branch that you want to be your next leader. Um, this, there's something called apical dominance. And in some plants it's stronger than others, but this bud puts out hormones that kind of suppresses the other buds. And when you remove that, that makes all the other buds in the branch grow. Um, and so you have to be aware of that. And so if you want this to be the leader, now this will be the dominant one. Versus if I cut um, here, this bud that didn't have a branch will grow out. Okay, so wherever you cut, all these buds will grow. So if you'd rather not have those buds grow and you just want that one branch, you cut it to here below the bud. Okay, don't leave a big stub, but don't cut into that. Does that make sense? All right. Um, the other thing, especially with young trees, like you have a young fruit tree or a young shade tree, you want to, um, you don't want, you want to pick the branches that kind of, you know, um, more level, especially fruit trees, they'll actually, you don't want a tight lifting up that kind of branch you try to get rid of. Um, they're stronger when they go out. And then it just, you know, you want a slight slant. You don't want to be too far from the bud because this part can rot. Too close, you can kill this bud. So just above it with a little slant so the water runs off. Um, 
And then, you know, you want to keep the branches in the direction you want it to grow. So a lot of times here, you, we have strong trades. And so you kind of keep the branches growing into the wind, for instance, so that your tree doesn't become lopsided. Okay, so it, it should, good pruning takes a little bit of time. Um, it's like kind of like giving a haircut. Once you get started, it's hard to stop. Um, so the trick, um, you guys remember William um, Jacinto, he was a, he's actually the arborist. Um, you know, he'd say, okay, put all your branches, you know, pile them up in one spot and step back and kind of compare. Have you, you know, are you still under your one quarter or one third? And if you're, if it looks like you've hit that one third or even a quarter of the branches, then stop. You know, so you have to make yourself stop. It's hard to stop. Um, so that's important. And you can come back in a few months, three or four months and prune it again if you need to. So, you know, you'd like your tree to, um, especially a fruit tree, you sort of want branches coming out at all angles. So take a look at that. We wanna avoid this cluster of branches. We wanna select branches that are apart from each other. And that's what you do with a young tree. You're trying to get what we call this good scaffolding. And then after that, you can hopefully leave it pretty much alone, okay? Um, and then just some common um, types of, of pruning. And of course, a big mature tree, especially over wires, obviously, I, I don't want you guys going out there doing that. But even if you hire somebody, um, make sure they're a certified arborist, number one. And number two, make sure they're going to do what you want them to do. So for instance, we call this crown raising, you know, like a branch is in your way to mow the lawn. You know, you'd, you'd get rid of those lower branches and that's crown raising. A lot of times we have problems with, you know, the tree is in the wrong place. It's bigger than we'd want it to be. Or even a fruit tree. You don't want the fruit tree getting so tall you can't pick it. And you don't just chop off the top. Yeah, you notice what they did here was they pruned back to a leader, right? Now this one, they took all of this out because I want this one to be the leader. Yeah, so that's called crown um, lowering. Oops. So that's what you want to do. You don't just chop the top off. That's the worst thing you can do. To it. You might as well chop right at the base of the tree if you're going to do that. Um, and then a lot of times our trees need to be thinned or, you know, the grass isn't growing underneath or you're not getting as much fruit production as you'd like because there's not enough light coming into the inner branches. So, you know, you can take selectively take out branches here and there and that'll let light come through. And sometimes that'll give you a little more fruit the next year. And then, like I said, this is what you don't want to do and what we see so often where, cause, cause this is a no brainer. See, this takes thinking. Okay. And you know how much we all love critical thinking. Um, and it takes time, right? And time is money. So this doesn't, this uh, a monkey who can run a chainsaw can do this. You just cut everything off, right? No thought. And then what happens is you get this flush of new shoots. The tree's like, holy crap, I don't have any uh, food source. So the tree is desperate and it pumps out and all the apical dominance has moved. So you send out these flush of branches. Um, all these branches are going to be weak. This area is going to tend to rot. Um, and these are more likely. So people will go, well, I don't want that. I don't want that branches falling on my house if it gets windy. Well, when you do this, these branches are weaker and they're more likely to break off. And then people hate trees on Maui and this is why. Um, there is one method called pollarding where you cut back to this same place every year and you let those shoots grow and then you cut them back. That's a special kind of um, pruning. That's about the only time you should really prune like this, okay? This is a no-no, stop the chop. I have to bring that up because it's one of my pet peeves. Um, coconuts or other palms, you know, um, the other thing I think people on Maui um, want to get their money's worth. So, wow, you know, the tree, the tree guy definitely came when you come home back from work. 
Um, actually, good pruning, you shouldn't even know they were there. Um, I was in California and you know, I happened to be home when they were trimming, but if you came back after they came, after they were there, you wouldn't have even known. And that's the kind of tree trimming you want. Um, same thing with cocos um, or other palms is the tendency is to, you know, make a bottle, you know, the guy is there, cut it back, um, make a bottle brush. Um, unfortunately, what happens there is once again, remember leaves photosynthesize, that's the food for the plant. The growing point is up here. So when it, this happens, the plant doesn't have as much energy and actually you'll get a thinning of the trunk at that point. And it can never, coconuts can't get any thicker that's, they, it's a, they don't grow wider uh, because their growing point is different than say a monkey pond. So it'll never recover from that. And if that happens, or, or severe drought, you'll see, you'll see some co older coconuts or other palms that have like, they kind of go in and out. Um, we had some at school that weren't getting water and they got real thin. And of course a big wind came and, you know, busted the tops. Um, so anyway, 180 degree angle. So if you have somebody come trim your coconuts, you know, tell them I don't want anything past 180 degrees cut off. Okay. So that's some basics of pruning. Um, okay. You want to rejuvenate some of your shrubbery. Um, if your shrub is really a mess, which I have those, you might have to do it, like I said, in increments. So, you know, come in and selectively shrubs are a little less um, exacting than say a tree. And it's not worth as much as a tree. A tree is actually, a, a nice big tree is actually worth a lot of money. People don't really realize that, but it adds a lot of value to your home or your condo or whatever. Um, anyway, just take out what, you know, a third at the most. And if you need to do more later, you can do that. Um, so you can do it this way. Um, you can also cut back, make it a little smaller. Okay. So be selective that way. Whoops. Um, hedges. We all tend to prune a hedge this way, so it's wider on top. But what that does, it shades the bottom. And then of course, which might be fine, you might be fine with your hedge looking like that. But most, a lot of times they want a hedge to be more full kind of privacy. So plants aren't gonna put leaves where they don't get sunshine. I mean, they're not going to waste their energy on that. So you really want to kind of try to train your head so it's a little thinner on top so that you get light, more light on the bottom. So you'll get more shrubbery, more branches and leaves at the bottom. Okay, so that's a little trick that most of us don't follow, including me. Um, and then just, you know, different shrubs are a little different. Like roses, you cut all the way back. So a totally different kind of formula. So different species might be different than what I'm saying. Another thing you can do with shrubs, like um, Joyce was talking to me about Aali'i. It's very shrubby when it's young, but then it sort of gets taller and the, and, and it, the undergrowth gets shaded and the bottom branches um, kind of die out. And that's when you can up prune into a small tree. So, you know, some of our yards are really small. So some of these shrubs can be turned into a small tree by, you know, crown raising them. Yeah, as they get bigger. So you can make like a small tree type of thing with a shrub and that can be really nice. So that might be something to consider for some of your shrubs. Okay, any questions on that? I think questions would help me. There's a question in the chat um, asking, can I prune the top branches if it looks dead and has yellow leaves? Yes, if it's, if any, any diseased or dead branches can be removed at any time. Yeah. So, you know, and I've had like, probably my lemon trees to put out so much lemons and then it started getting yellow and dying, but it probably, it got injured, bad cut, and the termites got in it and just, you know, annihilated one side of that tree. So that can happen too. So um, I've seen a lot of trees damaged. Um, 
Another thing to watch out for is like Norfolk Island pines, you know, cook pines. Um, you know, if you bang into those, they don't heal and they'll actually rot. And then, you know, you get a big wind and, you know, fall over. So be very careful around your trees. Don't weed the base because they can't heal. And that's always going to be a weak spot or a place for fungi or termites to get in. So they're, they're alive. It's not a, any other questions? It's just getting out and doing it, I think, is the hardest part. Um, and then read up on your species, like roses. And um, I think for roses, uh, the experiment station would cut them back. It depends when you want flowers, but they would cut them back um, January, February to get May flowers, something like that for Mother's Day. So, but they should be pruned back every year, pretty, pretty strongly, winter time. Okay, lawns. Well, it depends a little bit. We, we have in Hawaii, we have warm season um, turf grasses. And most of those turf grass species, or all of them actually, are stoloniferous um, or have rhizomes. And so they creep and they fill in. Um, whereas in the northern cool season, grasses like Kentucky bluegrass or fescue, they're bunch grasses, so they're a little different. Our grasses, um, somebody asked me a question just the other day, like, well, you know, there's some bare spots. My husband wanted to buy seed and throw it out there. I was like, don't do it. You need to know what your species is if you need to renovate a part of your lawn, because you don't want to mix species in Hawaii, um, because they, they look so different. Um, on the mainland, they do it all the time, because they have the same blade with and this kind of the same color, but all of these species have a little different color, a little different blade width, and so they'll look weird together. Um, so there are various, and there's some newer zoishas actually. Uh, zoishas um, and El Toro and Emerald look totally different. Uh, Bermuda grass, there's Monone, common Bermuda grass, and then hybrid varieties, and then seashore. Um, St. Augustine is that broad leafed grass that grows really well in the shade and handles a lot of salt. Seashore past Balam handles salt. Um, seashore and Bermuda are the two that need the most light. They will not handle any, very little shade. Um, El Toro Zoysia can handle, is a little bit shade tolerant, but none of these um, St. Augustine, if you have a very shady, it's shady all the time. St. Augustine's your best bet. Um, centipede kind of likes acid soils. It's a little broader bladed grass. And for those of you up country, you may have Kikuyu no matter what. And then if you live in a really wet place, you have some really kind of more like weedy turf turfs that aren't considered fine turfs. So that's hard for folks. They'll say, you know, what should I do with my turf? And I kind of need to know what kind it is um, to give a good answer. Because they're a little different. So I want to, here's the thing most of us do wrong, is mowing. Mowing is the cultural practice for grass, right? And the idea behind mowing is to just cut the tips of the leaves off. Because once again, we don't want to cut into stem or cut too much of the leaf off because that's the energy for the plant. That's how it makes its food. So you got to remember grass is a plant. So what happens is many of us, including us here um, at my house, is that eh, we just get out and mow maybe twice a month, right? So when you do go mow, then you get all these brown patches because the grass has grown so much when the mower comes by, it cuts into the stem instead of cutting one third of the leaves off. Um, so if your grass isn't doing well, I, you know, nine times out of 10, it's because you don't mow often enough. Uh, Bermuda and seashore, that should be in the summer should be mowed at least once a week. Um, and it, 
the lower it's mode, the more often it needs to be mowed because each one third increment. So a golf green, and that's grass living right on the edge of life because it's got very little uh, leaf material. They have to mow that every day, six days a week because it grows a little bit. And in order just to cut the leaves off, you gotta get in there and mow it. A fairway, which is maybe mowed at a quarter of an inch or half an inch, you know, three times a week. Okay, your lawn, you're probably gonna let it be a little bit taller. Um, and in the summer, once a week, and sometimes even twice a week, if you really want a nice, really nice lawn, okay? So, um, so then you have also have to pick how high to mow your grass. That'll make a difference. If you're not gonna mow very often, you're gonna wanna be at the highest height for that turf grass, okay? Um, let me see if I have, there we go. Um, so it's kind of based on species. Um, seashore and well, hybrid Bermuda doesn't do well uh, mowed too high. Yeah, but see, you, you could mow yours one inch, whereas the fancy condo uh, might mow theirs at a half an inch even. They got to get out there and mow it. You know, El Toro is a little more like bluegrass. You know, you can even leave it an inch and a half to almost two inches. And so that you don't need to, and zoysias are a little slower growing, so they wouldn't need to be mowed quite so often. But if you mowed it at half inch, you definitely need to mow it once a week in the summer. So, um, so it does depend on your turf grass, the height that you, you mow it. And then there's a definite change from summer. So we're coming into summer. As we get into April, the days are longer. It starts to warm up. All these grasses are tropical. And so, you know, Hawaii is kind of subtropical. So like we've been having really cold nights. Um, and the grass doesn't grow that much in the winter or much lower. But you start getting moving into April, May, it's going to really pick up. And that's when you really have to, you have to mow more often. So maybe you can go every two weeks in the winter. Uh, but in the summer, you might have to mow every week, for instance. So that's something to keep in mind. So mowing is really important because it's, if you go through and you scalp it and you have those brown patches, well, now the grass is stressed. It's got to use all its stored energy or use stored energy to regrow leaves. As it's stressed, it's more patchy. What comes in in those empty places? Weeds, right? So the best weed control in a lawn is healthy grass because these grasses are really aggressive actually. You'll have very few weeds if you mow it properly and do everything that you're supposed to do. Um, I'm not advocating that you have like a golf course type of lawn. Um, I'm advocating you kind of mow it at the highest that's so you don't have to mow it as often, but you mow it when it's needed rather than when you sort of feel like it. Yeah, does that make sense? Any questions on that? The type of mower you have makes a big difference too, but you know, you have what you have, so. What do you think about dichondra? I have dichondra in parts of my, um, my um, not lawn, but on the side where the plants are and I really like it. As a ground cover, yeah. It's a really thin, 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 you know. But really um, is it McCoy grass? What they call McCoy grass? It's a sedge. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. Sometimes that pops up where it's shady. And you know, that you probably don't mow it. So, you know, you mow turf, but you don't mow other stuff. Although people do that, like they'll mow like, or they'll weed eat say Wedelia. And it's like, it's not made to do that, right? It wasn't, it didn't evolve. This stuff has evolved to be close cropped by animals. And that's why I can tolerate mowing. Yeah, but timely, timely mowing is important for your lawn. So you might find if you mow it a little more frequently in the summer, your lawn will just look better because it'll start to fill in and you'll have less weeds. You might have to do a little weeding. Okay, um, 
So it's the one third rule. So you're trying to just cut the leaves, not the stem. Okay, irrigation. Obviously that's important for grass. Grass is kind of, I mean, you know, sugar cane's a grass, your lawn's a grass, grass is a big water hog. Um, and so, you know, turf is, turf serves a particular purpose. Um, it's for frolicking. Um, it's, it, you know, it's a ground cover that you can walk on basically. And so in some of our landscapes, you know, nobody walks on that piece of grass. So, you know, that could actually, if you wanted to save water, be something else, you know, some kind of ground cover or bedding plant or um, grass actually takes more energy and um, water and for, than almost anything in the landscape. You know, and unfortunately, um, because the other parts of the landscape, maybe you got to bend over and pull a weed once in a while, whereas, you know, and sit on a mower and drive. Um, a lot of times people will convert, oh, it's weedy. So they convert it to grass, which is really, you know, but you're on that lawnmower every week burning fossil fuels. and That's really not the way to go. So lawn should actually be restricted to, you know, if you're going to use it, you know. So when your kids are little, you want a lot of lawn and maybe later you convert some of that lawn to something else. It also helps tie the landscape together. Uh, but, but to have a nice lawn, you got to have water if you're in a dry place. Um, and if you're in a really wet place, what happens is these grasses like carpet grass tend to take over because they tolerate wetness. Um, so it's a little harder to have a fine lawn actually where it's really wet. Um, but a lot of times, you know, the clock was maybe set by your landscaper or the default on a clock, like the lights go out is like 10 minutes every day, okay? Um, God doesn't water every day, neither should you, is what I tell my students. Um, what happens is plants are lazy. I mean, they're not gonna grow where they don't, if they get water is only on the top of the surface, it's where their roots are gonna be. So, you know, try to water a little deeper and less often, you know? In the winter, maybe twice a week. In the summer, maybe three times a week. Maybe in Kahului in the sand, you got to do it four times a week. But you should try not to water every day. Um, generally, depending on where you are, you need about one to inch and a half of water a week to keep your lawn nice. In the winter, you can cut that back. Yeah, and there's ways to figure out how much that is. I won't get into that, but um, and. Those little pop-up sprinklers um, that spray, that they put out a lot of water, uh, surprisingly enough. So you may only need 10 minutes or 15 minutes, three times a week with those. Whereas some of the ones that have more like a spider thing, they may have to run for an hour or the other kind of sprinkler. So it really depends on your sprinkler, how long that is. Okay, so that's another talk for another day. Um, and then, you know, fertilizer, you know, especially when you start your lawn, um, you need to fertilize, um, you know, golf courses and really fine turf might use a pound of nitrogen a month. You don't need to come anywhere near that, um, especially once it's established, but you probably need to fertilize occasionally, you know, maybe, maybe in April and maybe again, April or May, and maybe, maybe a little, if you really want your lawn to look sparkly, um, and maybe one more time in the summer, July or something, or August. Um, I recommend, a, you know, spending the big bucks and getting a turf fertilizer that's got that slow release. And because a turf fertilizer has iron and sulfur in it. And I mean, basically in turf, you want green. Well, nitrogen makes things green because nitrogen is part of protein and chlorophyll is <laughs> a protein. But there's also iron and sulfur. So... You need that ratio of iron and sulfur. Um, some of our soils are deficient in iron or they're high pH soils for those of us living at low elevation. So, and then slow release, you won't get that flush, okay? Um, I wouldn't fertilize in the winter. 
And then ideally you're using a mulching mower so that, and you're, you're mowing frequently. So that's the other problem with mowing not often enough. If you're getting big piles of grass, you got to rake up or you have to catch your clippings. That means you're not mowing frequently enough. You want those clippings to go right back into the ground because that's organic matter and has all the nutrients. And you know, you might not need any fertilizer or very rarely if you're putting all your clippings back in the ground once your turf is healthy. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? Okay, so here's the thing with wands especially if you have seashore past panelum and some of the zoishas, Bermuda not so bad, um, is seashore probably once a year ide ideally, is you rent or hire somebody to come verticut, um, maybe once every two years in a, in a lawn. But um, what it is, it's verticutting or it's vertical mowing. So the blades go vertically. And what it does, it cuts through the thatch layer. The, the thatch, um, that comes from those, um, your clippings and the leaves that fall off. And those leaves have a waxy layer on it and it can inhibit water getting down and it just, um, and seashore gets thatchy and some of the zoysias get really thatchy. And so what that does, it it comes through and it cuts um, the stolons, which will kind of inspire them to make new little grass bunches, I guess. So it'll kind of green up. Um, it takes away some of that thatch and cuts into the dirt. So it lets more air uh, and water come through. But, but the big thing is it kind of rejuvenates the grass to make more, more um, blades, if you will. Okay, and kind of levels the turf. So, your lawn will look really ugly, especially if they do a serious verticutting. It'll be brown and hideous. It'll you have to rake up all that thatch. Great mulch for the rest of your garden. Um, so it's kind of a big job. It's kind of a weekend job, um, depending on how big your lawn is. But it will um, definitely um, your lawn will look great in about a month, and it'll be beautiful, lush. Um, um, green and that a lot of times at that point you throw on fertilizer right after you verticut and your lawn will be lovely. Yes, yeah, question. I have a question. Go ahead. I've always heard it was better to water your lawn late night or early morning. Is what's the best time? Um, I would say early in the morning. Um, before it gets windy, you know, five in the morning. And the reason rather than in the evening is that water might sit there and you could have disease issues. Um, but yet it's windy here. So that throws off your, you know, wind will kind of throws away your distribution of your water. So, you know, four or five in the morning, even three in the morning, two in the morning. So it'll get sun of it, you know, and dry up sooner rather than having a whole evening of being dewy? That's a great question. Another another question is um, recently, but I've been getting a lot of nut grass. Huh. Is there a way to, like, I know there's some kind of fertilizer or... Um, there's some herbicides. Okay. I mean... Um, I've, something I've called sedge hammer. Yeah, I've used that and it's always come back after a while. Is there any way, yes. by the way, get rid of it? Well, when you find it, let me know. Um, you have to apply more than once. And, you know, any of these control measures never eliminates. They only reduce populations. Exterminate isn't what happens. So nut sedge is, a, especially if it's purple nut sedge, it's virtually impossible to completely get rid of it, it will reappear. But the best bet is sedgehammer. Um, you apply it and then when you see it again, you apply it again. You have less and less. And then good mowing. But yeah, it's, yeah, I don't have a good ant. Uh, yeah, I don't have a magic, I don't, um, I don't have any fairy dusts. You know, I 
I realized that's what I needed when I watched Cinderella with my kids. It's like, oh my God, you know, there's, there's no magic thing that eliminates those kinds of things, but you can reduce it a lot. And it's better to get after it because what those things do, they very quickly make nuts and they make thousands of those nutlets. And, you know, so it's better to, when you see it, go after it, you know, spot treat it. Yeah. And I just, um, as far as watering, I just mm -hmm. um, planted some seashore with, um, by plugging. Um, yeah. Now do we, um, in the beginning stages, I, yeah, we, in the beginning, we water a lot. Yeah, Is that true? you water more frequently, yes. Yes, well, definitely. Absolutely. You definitely water more frequently. So like plugs, they're gonna have um, roots. So they're not as susceptible to, you know, you, you wouldn't have to water them every day. Um, well, you might the first, uh, so like what we usually do is we water every day for the first maybe two weeks and then we start to wean it off a little bit. Um, if you have stolons, you'd water, you know, you water multiple times a day, like lightly, because you don't want it to be super wet either. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, kind of wean them off. And then the other, the other trick when you have a new lawn is, um, especially when you plug it, what's going to happen is like, it's going to kind of be lumpy. Yeah. Um, and the grass wants to just sit there. What you want it to do is put runners. So you should mow it as soon as you can. So if, especially, but of course, if you have a brand spanking new mower, you want to bust up your mower. So if you can get an old crappy mower, you can mow frequently, you know, until your lawn comes in, um, it will run sooner by doing that. And then you just, you know, and the weeds will come up, just mow them, mow them, mow them. And then later, whatever weeds end up surviving that you can take them out but mowing is key because otherwise it's just going to make clumps for a kind of a long time and then eventually you. you know you'll have seashore all over the place and it'll drive you crazy it's pretty it's a pretty aggressive grass once it gets going okay and that definitely will benefit from vertical cutting when it after it gets established you know like a year or two but you could probably maybe go two years before you need to do it but it'll it'll really benefit from that Seashore. You can rent them at service rentals, or and then you have make sure your kids are there to rake. It's raking up the thatch that's actually the hard part, and it depends how hard you do it too. I mean, if it doesn't need it, it looks good for you, then don't worry about it. Any other questions? All right, aeration. You know that's kind of a harder core thing. I had a, um, I lived in a little condo and, you know, tiny yard. So it got compacted pretty easily, you know, because you walk in the same place. So if you have compaction problems, um, then your grass is not growing good and stuff isn't growing, then you may need to core aerate. Um, uh, you can rent them. Um, the best ones are, don't just roll. Those don't really do that great, but they actually, reach down in and they pull the cores out. What that does, that lets air and water in, the soil fills in later and um, it gives you more healthy turf. So, but that's a little higher end. Vertical cutting's simpler. Any question about aerating? You know, and you'd aerate, sometimes they aerate and vertical cut at the same time, but that's, that's a little extreme. That's kind of a golf course thing. But you might have an area you need to rejuvenate just because it's um, just not growing because it's so compacted. You know, that place where you park your car and your lawn and always drive, what happens? It compacts the soil. There's no air. It takes out all the big pores and stuff's not going to grow good there no matter what you do, unless you aerate it and rejuvenate that. or you put grass block and grow your grass in there and that protects the grass from compaction. Okay. Another thing you can do with vertical cutting um, or a new lawn is, you know, a layer of compost, if you can afford it, um, helps a lot. So. Okay, um, Joyce was bringing up ground covers, you know, like, 
you might have low white fern. Um, you know, every couple of years, kind of cut it back, rake it, get all that junk out of there, top dress it with compost, and then the little fernlets will come back and kind of rejuvenate that. Um, and you can do that with quite a few. Mondo, you wouldn't cut, but you'd rake it, fertilize it. With, you can fertilize it with compost too. Um, um, you can use a pre-emergent herbicide or you can get in there and just pull the weeds. Um, a healthy, once again, a competitive ground cover is, is the best weed control, but that doesn't mean um, also mulching. Um, let's see, any questions about ground covers? You know, a lot of times you just got to go in there and thin it out and kind of take the weeds out and give it a little compost. I'll kind of jump it back up. And then one thing I recommend, you know, we don't tend to do it here as much as on the mainland, but um, splurging a little bit and buying a flat of annuals to kind of dress up your yard, okay, is is... Nothing gives you as much color as annuals, okay? Uh, we're so used to stuff that we plant and it lives forever. Um, people aren't used to this, um, but it'll really, you know, have a little section in your yard, plant some annuals and some like vincas below the full sun. They'll last actually a long time and you can cut them back and they'll kind of rejuvenate. And then some annuals, they don't last that long, like marigolds or something. And you replace them. So you don't need to make a big area, but a small area. Um, and you can change out the colors. Um, you know, they're going to be need to change them every maybe three months for something short, like, like marigolds. Um, a little less, maybe once a year with something like vincas. Um, you know, change out the color. You want something hot, you know, red, yellow is exciting. You want to be kind of brings it forward. If you wanna kind of have things recede and be tranquil, then your blues and your pastels and um, just that little area can really boost your yard. And just a tip, if you wanna sell your house, invest in some annuals and make a couple annual beds with some color and it makes all the difference in the world. That's how I sold my condo. I just, boom, I put in a whole bunch of flowers, you know, pick the color scheme and, oh, it's so nice, you know, <laughs> it's like takes the, you know, it's first thing people see is the landscape. They don't see the inside of the house first, they see the outside. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and use mulch, 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 mulch in your beds, if you can get it. Um, that really makes a difference. The plants do better, it keeps temperatures even it kind of helps keep down weeds it's not going to eliminate weeds you're still going to have to bend over once in a while and pull that stray weed but it makes weeding a lot less and your plants will be a lot healthier and and you know so you might need to replenish your mulch you know once a year or so okay how'd i do oh not bad Questions? I'll stop my share. No questions. Nobody has a specific problem. Oh, sweet potatoes. Kaylee's been using sweet potatoes. Um, yeah, that's a good ground cover. One thing I noticed with my sweet potatoes is that they're starting to get a lot of uh, white flowers too. Yes. So I think I'm starting to infest my other plants because I have too much sweet potatoes now. Yeah, that'll happen. They get, they get, um, I mean, you can cut them back and they'll come back. Um, I mean, they're not going to go anywhere. They're just going to re-sprout and spread. They're hard to get rid of once you got them. Um, so you could do that, cut them back. Um, and then kind of, you know, throw some compost over them and, and they'll re regrow and, you know, you kind of eliminate those white, you know, kind of bag, throw that stuff in a garbage bag, oh, okay. and let it rot and they'll, they'll come back. 
I've been well, I've been cutting it out, but then I've been putting it into the compost as well. Yeah, and that that's it? fine. But you know, you might want to cover it so the adults, less adults, are flying around. It, it's always worse in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, as we start warming up, you're going to start seeing white flies. Okay, so that's what I'm worried about because I've got it everywhere now. So if the summer's going to yeah, then yeah, yeah, put... summer gets worse. Although um, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but sometimes. You have a huge infestation. Eventually, the beneficial insects come in, and then it's all better. So it depends well, on your tolerance, <laughs> how much you. Yeah, I, that's the other way to do it: is wait it out. Because I thought the idea was like, if I get them all infected, effect, uh, the sweet potatoes all infested with the bugs, then all my good vegetables won't be infested. But I'm pretty sure that's not. Really that's a lovely myth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, sometimes we use what that, you know, that's the trap crop idea. And the idea is, oh, they prefer that they go there, you get enough beneficials. So then when they do move to your other plants, uh, the beneficials are around and, you know, you don't get a heavy infestation. And sometimes it works. It depends a little bit on what species of white fly it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's counterintuitive to have beneficials. You got to have pests. So, um, and there's multiple species of white flies. So the white fly on your sweet potato might be very different than the white fly on some of your other things. It depends yeah, on I know that. there's like white flies on the peppers I have too, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if there's oh, yeah. species. Yeah. Spiraling white fly. Yeah, the pepper can cut back and they'll regrow too. Um sunny. Um so airy, nut, it's nut sedge, not a grass. So it's different than grass, uh, different family. Um, a large area covered by nut sedge. You know, that's, that's our, that's at school at Kahului. Man, it's, that's a bear. And really, I mean, you, you just have to use repeated doses of an herbicide like sedge hammer or manage or image. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, or live with it. That's, you know, there's no way, I mean, you can pull it, I mean, or you go out there every day and you pull them out, but you can't get all the nuts, so. Um, but, and then once again, the other part is, that's not, that's kind of too simple, is, is really working on your grass being healthy. Um, we've been oculating and that's where you put like black plastic or the weed mat down for a long period of time. And man, the nuts edge is like six months later, it's still alive. But you can do that too. If you're patient, you want to wait a year, just cover it with, you know, the weed mat real tight, you know, or black plastic and just let it kill everything. And, you know, water it first and put that down um, that you might get control that way. That's, and then plant grass and really treat your grass well. Um, so grass is pretty, com turf is pretty competitive if it's treated correctly, you know, the right mowing, right fertility, right water, um, but nuts edge does creep in there. Okay, um, sunny, diatomaceous earth. Um, it depends what it is, you know, they have to crawl through the diatomaceous earth. It can't get wet, so it works on some things, in small doses, I guess, but it doesn't get rid of, depends on the insects you're talking about, um, whether it's worth it. Okay, Kaylee, um, wood chips for mulch in like your flower beds or in the vegetable garden? Well, I'm trying to think, I'm going to get rid of all the grass and just put wood chips down, but I don't know if that's going to get, you know, help with the grass issue. I don't What's want to go grass? through it, pull them all out, and I just. What's your grass them. issue? Uh, yeah, it's it's not really grass. It's you know it's it's all kinds of crabgrass, and there's no real grass. It's just. It's just a weedy patch. Weedy that you patch, yeah. Yeah. I just kind um, of don't want to deal with this. I just want to cover it, but something that's not gonna. I don't know, something that's gonna. Help. Well, I think I think in that case. Um, You'd have to, yeah, I, I think you'd need to kind of maybe, um, I think it's going to grow through the wood chips. 
in that case. You know, you kind of need to either till it or or oculate it first with the black plastic or the weed mat or in sections um, to kind of kill that stuff down. Um, in the summer, it might be a little, you know, except for nuts edge, but you know, a month or so in that hot black plastic, you pull it back, it's pretty empty. And then put your wood chips right away. Then I think you'll have good luck with that. Okay, got it. Um, best strategies to tackle rose beetles. That's another tough one. Um, well, I usually look the other way um, and pretend I don't see that rose beetle damage. If it's not a, you know, if it's if it's not a major problem, I just ignore it. Um, but you know, like a little bit of feeding damage is no big deal, and they tend to move around after a while. If it's you know a small plant, it's a real problem. Um, there's two things you can do. One is you can spray in the evening, you know, something like seven or something like that, and kind of kill the adults. They fly there. Um, Spinosad, something like that, might work because they they have to feed on it. Um, and they come out in the evening, or you can shine a light and go out in the evening and pick them off. Um, if you've got a special plant, um, a dim light attracts them. A bright light makes them want to go away. My husband's been doing this thing where he made like a trap, whether it's really effective or not, I don't know, where there's a little dim light, like one of those little really dim solar lights over a, you know, a, a, a pan of soapy water and they fly in, they fall in there. Whether it's really controlling them, I don't know. They're eating all your ohia. Are your ohia little? Yeah, well, yeah, they're, you know, maybe like a couple feet tall. And yeah. so they're just eating. Are they in pots or are they? Sorry, say that again. Are they in pots or are they out in your landscape? They're, they're in the ground. They're in the ground. Well, um, I don't know if you could shine a light on them or just go out there some evenings with a flashlight and pick them off. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes that strangely enough is like in, in something, you know, unless you have hundreds of them uh, works fairly well. And um, yeah. So that you know, the tree, tree gets big enough, the your tree gets big enough and it, you know, doesn't, doesn't mind a little bit of feeding. Mm -hmm. They kind of aggregate. So once you get rid of them, then they might, then they're not, or you get rid of a bunch of them, they don't necessarily go to the same place. Okay. Um, um, diatomaceous earth, you could try that too. Put it on your plants and see if they get themselves scratched up. Um, do you put that, and do you put the diatomaceous earth right on the plants or do you put it on the soil beneath the plants? You, you could do both actually. Both. Okay, all right, I'll try that, thanks. Um, Black sooty mold. Yes, black sooty mold comes from, do you know what kind of bush bushes they are? Um, well, they have on the gardenia and yeah. um, peacocky bush. Okay, yeah, Gar I was gonna guess gardenia. So what you have on your gardenia is green scale, green coffee scale probably. So they uh, don't look like insects, they're like little green discs. They're gonna be on the leaves. Um, and they make honeydew. They suck so much sugar water, they have to suck a lot of it to get enough protein to survive. So out the back end comes honeydew, a sweet liquid and the ants, you might see a lot of ants, they farm them. And that sooty, that mold grows on the honeydew that either drips on the leaf below or is right on that leaf. And so when you see sooty mold, you know there's um, some kind of sucking insect. Um, uh, the best way to control that? Well, patience. You can be patient and eventually something's going to come eat them. And that might take anywhere from a couple months to two years. You know, it just depends. Um, you could use like a uh, insecticidal soap or an insecticidal oil to try to clean up the, um, uh, the scales. 
Um, you have to get it on the in. So if they're on the underside of the leaf, you have to get that bit of contact. So it has to contact them. And then controlling your ants, maybe with some amdro or something might help too, because the ants kind of protect them and move them around and put them in new places. So. Okay. Yeah. Right, Powdery mildew. Oh man. Um, powdery mildew. Well, the good thing about powdery mildew, there's a couple things you can do. Um, uh, I have a lot of problems with powdery. In fact, everywhere in Hawaii, we have a lot of powdery mildew. We have that warm, that's, it's a fungus that actually doesn't like free water on the leaves. So we have a lot of it, even in dry weather, it's humid enough. Powdery mildew is sulfur. So you can spray sulfur. Um, and then there's also something called cow green that works on powdery mildew. Um, you could probably look up, um, it's very similar to baking soda. So there's a baking soda formula you can also use um, and you could alternate between those two and those are both, um, unless you're growing commercially. Are you growing commercially, Kaylee? Or is it just your garden? Um, if it's just your garden, you can do that. Um, sulfur works really well and sulfur also kills mites. So, but you know, you spray it and you have to get it on the underside of the leaves too. Um, you might want to be careful and do that in the evening when it's not too hot. You have to rinse them off. So follow the direct. So you mix the sulfur with the water. Baking soda, yeah, probably if you put too much baking soda, let's see, bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate. Um, Cal green is potassium bicarbonate. Um, you know, if you don't add too much, it's probably not a big deal. But if you spray all the time, that might be a problem. Oh, good questions. Yeah, powdery mildew, at least there is an organic control for that. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Anne. This was so informative. We had right, so great. questions and the information was so interesting and helpful. Um, Everyone, please look out for the next Mayao series section, which is on bullet journaling. It's on April the 14th at um, 12 o'clock. The first 30 people to sign up will, will be receiving a, a bullet journal so that you can keep your, your schedule and all of the things in your lives um, coordinated. And then on April 20th, um, organization sanitation and kitchen safety. So um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much, Anne. That was really awesome. You can see all of their Very well. uh, your thanks in, in the chat. Okay, awesome. Thank you. That was fun.